Well, welcome to church today. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to worship our God.
today we're going to take communion and so I encourage you if you're in the room today hopefully you've grabbed the elements on your way in but if you haven't that's okay just pop up your hand where you are and the team feel free to take a seat by the way <laughs> and the team will uh, will bring that over to you if you're joining us online I'd love you to grab bread or juice or anything creative that you have uh, that can serve as the elements for you today well as we come to the communion table the word that I really sense for us today was thank you Thank you, Jesus. Thanking Him because He is the one 
who fights the battles for us and with us. He is the one who fought the greatest battle of all time, the battle against sin and death when he went to the cross for you and for me. And communion today is an opportunity to remember that, to remember Jesus' body that was broken and his blood that was poured out and to say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Regardless of the week we've had or how we're feeling today, to stop and to choose to say thank you, Jesus. In Matthew 26, 26, it says, As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. Let's eat together and thank Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Let's thank Jesus just quietly in our hearts as we drink together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you for your faithfulness and your goodness. Thank you for going to the cross for me. Thank you for going to the cross for us, for each and every one of us. Thank you that you are always with us and that we can access your grace so freely. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it, Lord, but you give it so freely. So we thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I invite you to stand as we continue in this time of worship together.
Yes, Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for the power in your name, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that we can declare your powerful name in our lives, in the lives of others, God. I just had a sense while we were worshipping, as we were declaring the name of Jesus, the Jesus who went to the cross and defeated sin and death, the Jesus who rose from the grave, giving us freedom and new life. There is an opportunity to declare Jesus' name over something in our lives and world that's happening right now. And so if that's you, I wanna encourage you to place your hands out in front of you in an act of surrender, an act of receiving. And just as we're gonna continue to sing that there is no other name, there is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He is the one who can overcome. He is the one who is in the battle. I encourage you to take that situation, to take that person on your heart, to take yourself and declare the name of Jesus. Declare His powerful, powerful name. Let's sing. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Jesus, thank you that we can access the power of your name. And Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would heal, that you would restore in the name of Jesus, that you would raise up in the name of Jesus, that you would draw people to yourself in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We just say thank you, Lord. We're so grateful. Thank you that we can bring everything to you, that we can lay it at your feet, that we can trust in your goodness and in your power. And God, as a community today, wherever we are, may we know that we can come together and declare the name of Jesus over situations for one another, God, that we can do life together under your name. I pray you would speak to us today, Lord, that you continue to move in our midst, Holy Spirit. We pray these things in your name. Amen.
Amen. Well, feel free wherever you are to grab a seat. So good to be with you. If we haven't met before, my name's Ash and I get the privilege of being on team here at Clovey. And I want to extend a special welcome to you. If it's your first time here today or you've been visiting us for a little while, so excellent to have you with us today. If you're joining us online, we would love to connect with you. If you could just click connect with us, then we can grab your details and our team can get in touch with you. And if you're joining us today here in the room, there's a place called The Point after the service where you can head out the doors to your left and the team would love to connect with you there and get to know a little bit more about you. Well, there's a great opportunity coming up. If you are all in on the life of Clovey and you want to know what it means to be a member, you want to know a bit more about our DNA, we have something called Discovering Clovey coming up. And that's on November 21st. It'll be at 9 a.m. on site at 12.30 on Zoom online. And we'd love you to join us. It's an awesome opportunity to say yes to Clovey, to our values, our vision, our mission, but also to get to know a bit more about that before you say yes. So come along uh, and be part of that. You can register ahead of time at Clovey clovey.com.au forward slash connect. Well, speaking of membership, we have a members meeting coming up and the awesome Mark Hurd is going to tell us a little bit more about that. So turn your attention to the screen. Hi, Clovey. It's Mark Hurd here from Church Council. Hope you're having a great day. I wanted to let you know that we have our members meeting for Clovey and Pathway coming up on Monday, the 29th of November at 7.30 at the church. Uh, these meetings are uh, always a really important time to gather uh, and this one will be no different as we'll get here in more detail uh, about the wonderful things God is doing at Clovey uh, and be updated on key ministry and project initiatives such as the auditorium upgrade. Uh, we'll also be voting and making decisions on the 2022 budget and nominations of a new council member which is exciting. So get along. We would love for you to be there and whether you're a member or not everyone is invited uh, if you can't make it absentee voting is available for members but you must register seven days before the meeting and if you want to know more about absentee voting and how it works please contact the church or go to the church website at clovey.com.au slash members so again just to remind you See you Monday, 29th of November, 7.30 at the church. We would love to see as many people as possible at the meeting to worship God together in this way. So bye for now. Have an awesome day. Well, thanks so much, Mark. So make sure you got those dates in your diary. Uh, Monday the 29th at 7.30 if you're going to come and join us here at Mobbury North. If you can't make it, make sure you get your absentee vote. It's called a notice of intention uh, in by the 22nd of November. And as Mark said, you can head to clovey.com.au forward slash members. All the info is there for you. Well, there are three ways to give here at Clovey for those who call Clovey home and they're up on the screen now. And we just want to say a huge thank you for your generosity. Our generosity is in the DNA of Clovey, and so we're so thankful. Would you join me uh, as we pray? Heavenly Father, again, we thank you. That is the word for today. Thank you. We thank you um, that you provide for us, that you are our provider, and that we can be blessed to be a blessing. We pray your blessing over the giving, Lord. Thank you to those who've already contributed and who will contribute. And Father, as we look ahead to this season of November and December with plenty coming up in the life of the church, we just want to pray your hand over that, Lord. So many opportunities for people to be invited to come to know you. And Holy Spirit, I pray you would speak to us in the busyness of this season that we wouldn't miss the opportunity to invite someone in our life and world, that you would give us courage to do so, Holy Spirit. And would we lean on you for that, Lord? And God, I pray as things like Jam and Echo Carnival, as Gingerbread Night, Carols, Christmas Eve and Day are coming up on our church calendar. I pray that they wouldn't just be events, God. That there would be opportunities to see people come to know you, Jesus. And Lord, would you give us the courage to invite them? Holy Spirit, would we be open to your sense and your presence as you put names on our hearts and minds? Lord, we ask that you would speak to us in this season. God, you are drawing people to yourself. And we're so thankful for that. And we're so thankful that we get to be a part of that, Lord. So I pray your hand a blessing over this season as we gather with friends and family and as our diaries are filling up, that you would speak to us, Holy Spirit, that we wouldn't miss what you're wanting to do in these next couple of months. 
We pray these things in your heavenly name. Amen. everyone, how are we going today? Going good, excellent. It's been a special uh, weekend in uh, the Baptist churches of South Australia. We had our annual assembly yesterday where the Baptist churches uh, get together, there's around 70 or so, and we celebrate things that are happening in the movement. And here at Clover, we have uh, eight delegates that represent on Clover's behalf, and it's a, a wonderful time to hear stories and to celebrate everything that God's been doing in Baptist churches and also uh, in Baptist care. But something quite relevant and personal for us here at Clover is that yesterday, Michelle was uh, announced as a reverend. So very, uh, very good thing. Uh, yep. Some of you are wondering what that actually means. Uh, and uh, basically uh, what that means is that um, Michelle's finished a two-year uh, formation and call cycle where uh, she's essentially submitted and surrendered herself to the Baptist Churches of South Australia accreditation process. And you go through that process, there's about 16 competencies in a range of different uh, ministry areas. You have a supervisor, which was Terry Williams from Ingle Farm Baptist Church. There's a church support team. And then you have to also complete your uh, studies. So she's um, just on the very tail end, I think, one assignment maybe, or you're in the last little bit of that to finish her Master of uh, Divinity through uh, the Australian College of Ministries. So it's a culmination of formation and also call, and it's a, a wonderful thing. So uh, we'll celebrate that with Michelle, uh, with Melinda Cousins, who will be coming in December for an ordination uh, service, so just so that you know. But that doesn't happen every day. I think the last pastor at Clovercrest that was accredited as a reverend while serving on staff was Mark Wilkinson. So we're going all the way back to the 1990s. So, you know, myself, I was a reverend before coming, and Mark Purser was the same. I think uh, Malcolm Wilson was a reverend, but that, that's pretty much it, you know. So it's, um, yeah, it's a great, uh, a great celebration, affirmation of your leadership, Michelle. So, yeah, let's put our hands together uh, and celebrate, Michelle. We're in this Thessalonian series, it's been a wonderful time, six weeks sitting in this book and I trust that you've been both encouraged and challenged as we've been learning what Paul uh, has to say to this young church in Thessalonica and just how pertinent and relevant it is for us today uh, is just a wonderful thing and it's how God uh, uses the, the living word and how it is um, still so applicable for us today. But do you know that we've been created for community and that we are better together? You know, I wonder if you can think of a time, even like push yourself to think recently of a time that you've received love, grace, generosity, assistance from another person or from another group of people. And how did that make you feel? How did you feel when someone reached out and they shared that love and that grace and that generosity with you? Or maybe think about a time uh, just recently where you've been that person to someone else and you've seen a need, and you've seen maybe someone else uh, hurting, or you've seen uh, an opportunity to bless someone, and you've stepped in there and you've done it. See, it's just a beautiful thing how God has created us to be in community. And we are indeed way better together. And that pushes back against the hyper-individualized culture and life that we live in. But it's a truth. It's a truth from God that we are better together. Uh, we've been experiencing this uh, over the last few weeks in the Stevens family. Michelle's been uh, recovering from some foot surgery. And, uh, you know, honestly, you know, I've been a pastor now for maybe 16, 17 years. And we've made a lot of meals for people over the journey. And we've seen a lot of opportunity to serve and bless others. But in these last three or four weeks, we've been on the receiving end. Uh, some of you, many uh, from the church, have reached out with love and care. And uh, Kids Pastor Anne, she put together a meal roster. We've been receiving meals from people. And I have been so humbled. I've been so humbled by the love and the generosity and the care of Clovey. And it just has reminded me what a beautiful community of faith that we have here, that we belong to, that we help shape and mold and move forward. And I've been again reminded how important it is that we've been created for community, 
how important it is to love and care, and for us to be on the receiving end, on, receiving end of that ha, has been quite humbling. And we've got one of our values here on the wall, creating community. And in there, we have uh, a line that says, doing life together. We've been created for community to do life together. And it is so important that we embrace that truth, that we embrace the truth that we have been created for community, even when we want to retreat into our individual lives or hide behind our screen or whatever it might be. We've been created for community. That's how God has designed us. And I think uh, for us, it's important that we remember that. And this truth that we've been created for community and to do faith and life with others is embedded deeply into Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. All throughout this letter, Paul has been uh, talking about the church as the family of God. He's been constantly um, flipping into and using relational metaphors and illustrations. His letter's relational. His care for this young church is real. He even sends Timothy to go and check in on them, to ask them questions about their faith. He gives them a framework to how to be a good Christian friend. I hope that you've been embracing that. And then he speaks to them about how they have been set apart, to live a life that pleases God, to to love others, and to introduce people to this man, Jesus. See, Paul, in many ways, is like a spiritual dad to this young church. He's like a spiritual father. And this last uh, section of the letter that we sit in today, 1 Thessalonians 5, and we're going to pick it up from verse 12, uh, Paul uses the the words brothers and sisters five times. As he's landing this letter, he uses brothers and sisters five times, just emphasizing his relational approach to this young church. Essentially what Paul is doing in this uh, last part of the letter that we're going to sit in today He's talking about what true Christian community looks like, what it looks like to have a shared faith. It's okay that we have our own relationship with God, but we exist in a community of faith, and our faith becomes richer as we live it out with others. And what Paul does is he outlines four key features here of what true Christian community actually looks like. And I've got this uh, stool here today. I'm going to use this stool as a bit of an illustration. I want you to keep this in mind about the four key features that Paul speaks about around true Christian community. Because in many ways, the features that he talks about are like these legs on the stool. And each of these legs, they need to be balanced. They need, they need to be able to work with the others so that this stool is effective. And it's actually the same when Paul comes to uh, talking about what true, authentic Christian community looks like. He's got these four features, but they need to work together. And they need to be in balance so that they can be effective. And I really believe this is a word in season for us as a church, but also as a culture right now. Because as I look around our culture, over these last two years... I'm noticing that we have, uh, we're lacking tolerance in a lot of areas of life. We're lacking a lot of tolerance in our society, and I'm also noticing that our resilience is, seems like it's evaporating as well. And these two things, a lack of tolerance, if someone has a different view to me, then I just wipe them off, and this lack of resilience, really um, having the grit to work through uh, the situations that we find ourselves in, and hey, these last two years have been pretty rough, And we've walked together in those, all together uh, as a church family. But I've been noticing this lack of tolerance in society and a lack of resilience. So as we come to this message today, I believe that Paul has a word in season for us as a culture and a people. And it's something where if we have ears to hear, we can learn how how can we grow in our community? How can we grow in the strength of living God's Uh, mission together and being his family together. I really believe it's a word in season uh, for us. So let's look at this first leg of the stool. This first leg of the stool, and we're in 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, picking up from verse 12 here. The first leg of the stool is a led community. Uh, Paul says this from verse 12. He says, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace. With one another. So, effective leadership is crucial to true Christian community. And what Paul is saying here is he's saying that a true Christian community will acknowledge its leaders and hold them in high regard, those who God has appointed to care and admonish. Uh, These words, care and admonish, mean, mean to teach, correct, and caution. 
So another way of saying uh, what this means for us here at Clovey is that there'll be a respect for those that God has put in leadership, those that are in the church council, those that are on the staff team, the pastoral team, those that are on our team Clovey who serve and, and, um, and lead in different and various ways. But what does a leader look like in the family of God and in the community of God? Well, a leader looks like someone who is a servant. Because when we look at the person of Jesus, we see a servant king. We see someone who gave up all of his rights and the right hand of the Father and came from heaven to earth to serve all of humanity. And this is what Jesus says about leadership from Mark 10. He says, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be our first must be slave of all, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So true Christian community has effective leadership, but what does effective leadership look like? It looks like service. It looks like being a servant. And I actually believe this is something that, if you've been part of Clovey for some time, I I really believe this is something that we're growing in. And and I really want to affirm the leadership here at Clovey. I want to thank uh, each of our church council members uh, who over the last few years have been doing a whole lot of proactive work around building the culture and the environment on how we lead here at Clovey. Uh, the, the church council have been doing an enormous amount of work you know, behind the scenes in the back room around leadership and governance and being effective in how we can actually please God in how we lead here as a church. That culminated in a constitution review last year and was really, uh, really significant as we laid the platform and the foundations for where God wants to lead us into the future. I'm also really grateful for our staff and ministry team Uh, I think uh, over these last two years, in any environment in which you are a part of and in which you lead, I think the last two years have shown you if that environment is healthy or not. Because when something's put under pressure, when you're put under pressure, what's inside comes out, right? That's what happens. You know, you squeeze an orange, what comes out? Well, you're going to get orange juice. Whenever you put under pressure, what's inside of you comes out. And as our staff and ministry team have been put under enormous pressure these last two years. It's been a really difficult time to lead. Honestly, I think it's probably been my most difficult couple of years uh, in my working life these last two years. It's been really difficult to lead in an environment where the foundations keep shifting and moving and changing. And we want to create a safe environment. We want to keep worshipping and keep being mission-focused. And it's been uh, tricky. But what I can say is that during this season, the staff team, I believe, has grown in unity. They've grown together. They've grown to be shared in their mission and in their collaboration and their alignment. And I hope that you've noticed that. And I want to affirm the staff team. And also, each one of you who serve. We have over 400 volunteers in the life of the church that serve in over 650 positions. It's incredible. It's huge how you serve tirelessly, week in, week out, Uh, often without being noticed, but continually serving. And I want to say thank you so much because it's so important that we uh, come together and we lead together in this way because leaders are servants and leadership is a crucial aspect and feature to true Christian community. So let me ask you a question. Do you hold the leaders of Clovey in high regard? The church council, the staff, the ministry team those who you serve alongside in a volunteer capacity? Do you hold the leaders in high regard? Why or why not? And is there a leadership role that God is asking you to step into so that you can develop and enrich the community here at Clovey? Have you considered that perhaps you stepping into a leadership role and serving in this way would enrich the community and bless the community? And it's actually a key feature for how we, uh, I guess, uh, work together for the kingdom of God. So the first leg of the stool here is leadership. The second is that we'd be a caring community. Verses 14 to 15 say, And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. This is Paul's encouragement. Warn the idle and the disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak and be patient with everyone. Oh, gee, why did he have to use an absolute? (laughs) Like, seriously. Why can't I just be patient with the people that are like me or the people that I agree with or the people that are my friends? He doesn't say that. He just throws out the absolute. 
Be patient with everyone. Wow. That's for all of us, I think, isn't it? See, the thing about creating a caring community, it's just not the leaders who do that. Actually, caring is an everyone activity. It's not just a job for the leaders, but for all of us. Care is an everyone activity. And we try to, in a church of our size here at Clover, we try and, and very intentionally set up strategies and ways to care for people. Uh, Peter Corney, who's a pastor uh, from Melbourne in the Anglican Church, he says, as church gets bigger, it needs to become smaller. And if you've been to one of our meet and greets, you've heard that. And it's very, very important that, particularly in a church our size, we look at how we, how we care for people. Uh, because we believe that caring for the one is so important. Jesus teaches us that. And it's very important that everyone knows that they are indeed cared for. And caring for people needs to be a relational pursuit. And we believe that it's a relationship with God and with others that is the glue that holds the caring nature of the community together. So very, very important. And for us here at Clovey, that starts in life groups. We want you to be connected into a life group so that in smaller groups you can care for one another. Uh, we have a pastoral care team that does uh, some work around people who um, particularly are less mobile or shut in or uh, at an age where they're not able to get out and about as much. But primarily we see care in life groups and we encourage you to be part of a life group, be part of a serving team where you can actually be known and you can know other people. Really important way and part of caring for another person. And I believe this is a strength uh, of ours as well here at Clovey, um, but it's something that we always have to keep working on. You know, in a previous iteration, the little um, tagline for Clovey was a people who care. You might remember that. And I think care is part of our DNA. It's part of who we are. But it's something that we have to keep working on. Something that we can't just let slip or let kind of slide by. And it's not just for the leaders, it's for everyone. And I do want to, again, just put out there, if there is something going on in your life and in your world, maybe you haven't been able to talk to someone, we are here for you. And we want to make sure you get connected into the right people relationally so that you get um, the relationship and the help and the assistance that is needed at this time. Because having a caring community is a feature and a hallmark of what it looks like to participate in the kingdom of God and a really important aspect of that. And it might be that there's something going on in your world right now. And uh, it might be that you want to send an email through to us at care at clovercrest.com.au. Completely confidential and we can walk with you in that. It might also be uh, that you might be just reassessing your situation around how you are known and how you know others, and you might be just looking at that in your life as we finish this year and go into next year, and it might be that you're not in a life group and you want to look at that, uh, and I encourage you to fill in a connect card so that we can follow you up and actually walk with you in and through that as well. See, there's a robustness to, to, to true Christian community, one where faith is worked out, being in deeper, accountable relationships. Paul talks about here, he says, warn also encourage and then show patience. And, and, and I guess it needs to be asked, are you in relationships in your life where people do warn you and you take that on board, where, where you are encouraged to step into more and you show patience with those that maybe are a little bit different to you, but you find unity in the body of Christ because that's a feature of what it looks like to be in true Christian community. So that's the second leg. The third leg is a worshipping community. Paul goes on to say this. He says, Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Don't quench the spirit. Don't treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good and reject every kind of evil. I love what Paul's saying here. Rejoicing always, praying continually, thanking constantly, then ask for more of the Spirit. This is what we've been doing today as we worship God and want to experience more of Him. We want to position ourselves before God where we're rejoicing, where we're thanking, where we're praising Him and we're asking God for more of Him and then saying, Lord, we want to listen to you. We want to have an ear to what you say. And Lord, we want to make sure if there's any sort of evil, any sort of sin in our lives or in the church, please take that away. We don't want that to be part of who we are. I don't know about you, but when I think about what Paul is saying here, this is the type of Christian community that I want to be a part of. I don't know about you. I don't want to go through the motions. I don't want to tick the boxes. I don't want to keep shrinking as the church in the West is doing. I want to put my foot in the door and say, Lord, let it be different here. 
Let us have a heart for you, an intimacy for you. Let us come to our worship gathering so expecting that you are going to move in a way, Lord, that we are open and want to say yes to and celebrate with you in such a way that, that we're released into all that you have for us during the week. That's the sort of vibrant Christian community that I want to be a part of. And Paul is saying here, he's saying rejoice always, pray continually, thank constantly. Jerry uh, Trousdale, in his book Kingdom Unleashed, he argues that one of the reasons that the church in the West is declining and this is a reality, you have to understand this, a lot of the global statistics for um, Christianity are getting skewed because the church in the majority world, Africa, India, China, South America, is growing rapidly. And the church in the West, so the UK, uh, America, US, Canada, Australia, is going down. So the global statistics are skewed because the rapid growth in the, West, in the, in the um, majority world and the, the, I guess the atrophy or the decline in the Western world. And he says one of the reasons that he believes that the church in the West is declining is because the church is praying small prayers to an almighty God. How's that? The church is praying small prayers to an almighty God. And this guy, you should look him up, Jerry Trousdale. He's been working in Africa for the last 50 years uh, training leaders, planning churches, thousands and thousands of churches that have reached hundreds of thousands of people with the gospel. And he says this about how they train people for these movements. He says, we don't see prayer as a program. We see prayer as a lifestyle. We begin by prayer. They, the people that they're training and working with, see us praying, we pray together, and they know that when we come together, we pray. And everything starts with prayer. Now, this is not new information, is it? This is not something that is like, oh, wow, this is new. No, because the church in the West, it doesn't have an information problem, has access to every bit of information needed. It has a transformation problem because we aren't positioning ourselves and coming to God where we are rejoicing always, praying continually and thanking constantly. We're not maybe putting ourselves before God and saying, God, you know, what is that prophetic word by faith you have for us as a church? How can we wait on you? How can we reject evil? We don't maybe always move into that. It's a good challenge for us because a worshiping community is a key feature of what it means to be in true Christian community. I love what Pastor Luke is bringing to the worship department. He's got this phrase, wholehearted worshippers. I love it. Wholehearted worshippers. And that's a challenge for all of us. For all of us to be a people who are wholehearted in our worship for God. To be a people who embrace that first value of experiencing God, that we would be Bible-based, that we would be all in on prayer and worship and we'd be faith-filled and spirit-led. My ask of you is that you would prepare for our times together. And you might already do, and that's great. Prepare your heart, prepare your mind. Be expectant that God is a God who is living and active and dynamic and has a word for you every time we gather. And during the week as well, when we scatter off into the different parts of our lives to live the things that we talk about when we gather together, know that God wants to grow us in our worship of him. And the fourth leg is a holy community. This is what Paul says as he closes the letter to the Thessalonians. He says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body, all of you, be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all God's people with a holy kiss. And I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Now, I'm not sure about the holy kiss in COVID times. You're, everyone's wearing a mask, so I'm sure you can work that out. But Paul brings us back to one of the central themes for this letter. He brings us back to holiness. And two weeks ago, I preached on holiness. And holiness is to be set apart. 
to be unique. And, and what Paul is saying here is he's saying he asked God to sanctify the Thessalonians. And that, another word for sanctify is holy, to become more holy. So what he's saying is I want you to become more like Jesus so that you, you're blameless. And this word blameless means innocent or righteous or, or faultless. He's saying to this young church, I want you to be holy and grow in your holiness so that you're blameless, you're innocent, um, you're, you're faultless when Jesus comes again. So he's asking them to lift their eyes. They might feel like they're in the pressure cooker situation of Thessalonica trying to launch this new church amongst all this persecution and hostility. And he's saying, grow in your holiness and know that it's God that will make you faultless so that you can lift your eyes and know that he's coming again. Keep going, is what he's saying. Keep going. Don't give up on pursuing holiness. And true Christian community pursues holy living. It's what it does. True Christian community pursues holy living. And Paul says in verse 24 that it's God who's going to do it. We don't have to worry about this. It's God who will do it. He's faithful. So pursue him and live a holy life. So this is what we have for our four uh, legs of the stool. Paul encourages this young church around leadership. He encourages them around growing in their care. Uh, he, he desires for them to be a worshipping community and a community that pursues holiness. These are the four features of true Christian community that Paul is impressing upon this young church. And he's basically saying, you know, when you come up against the challenges of life, and there will be many when you choose to follow Jesus, how do we work our way through these challenges? Well, we, we look to the leaders, effective leadership. We make sure that we're creating a community of care. We keep our focus on Jesus and we worship him. And we pursue holy living in our lives. And I think this is a word of, in season for us. I think this is a word for us where we find ourselves at the moment. Particularly in a situation where over the next six months, I think things could get a little bit lumpy in South Australia. We're in a very interesting situation where, I don't know, is there any other cities around the place that are welcoming COVID? But the damn wall of the, the borders will break and COVID will enter our state. And we're going to have to work out how we're going to handle ourselves. We're going to have to work out how do we develop unity in the life of the church? How do we work out that church is a family and church is for everyone? We're going to have to wrestle with this. We're going to have, have to wrestle with the differences that we have with people. You would have already had to wrestle with the differences with people. But I'm worried that our tolerance is waning and our resilience is low. It, it honestly worries me. I'm hearing some things and seeing some things, even in the church, that worries me. But I want to, I want to say for us here at Clovey, I want us to be known for what we're for. And I want us to know and, and be challenged with the thought that when life potentially will get a little bit difficult, what, how are we going to step towards each other as sisters and brothers and not step apart? How will we grow in unity, even if we have a difference of opinion with someone around vaccination status or whatever it might be? We need to step towards each other in unity and love and not with division. How do we do that? I think Paul gives us the framework, the four legs of this stool. Leadership, care, worship, and holiness. If we pursue these things, we'll find a way. We will. We'll find a way. And if we pursue these things, we show the wider community what the church is for. Don't you think the church has had a bad rap for long enough? 
about all the things we're against that we've done wrong? What about in this season if we move forward with what we're known for? And even if we have disagreements with our fellow sisters and brothers, we work together for unity and we step towards each other in love. And God will continue to sanctify us, make us holy so that we're blameless, we're faultless, we're innocent on the coming of the Lord Jesus. You know, I've found it really interesting across my life, there's a number of different things that people disagree with all the time. You know, this is part of even sometimes what it means to be Baptist, believe it or not, the autonomy of the local church, congregationally governed. We are quite different to other Baptist churches, but we fit within the family of the Baptist churches because we strive for unity in our, in our diversity. It's kind of like what it means to be Baptist. And over these next six months, you're going to come up against things personally, and we're going to come up against things as a church that might confront us. We might be feeling like we're lacking in a bit of tolerance or resilience. But Paul gives us the framework. Leadership, care, worship, and holiness. They're the four legs of the stool that in balance are effective. And I think we need to hear this, all of us, as we consider what it means to be the people of God who love God, who love others, and to share his message of hope in our community. Will you stand with me? Let's pray together. Loving God, we thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. We thank you that it's you are the one that we look to. We thank you, Lord, that we are a family and that is a beautiful thing. So Lord, as we are both encouraged and challenged by what it means to live in true Christian community, Lord, I pray you'll grow our leadership and our care, our worship and our pursuit of holiness. And Lord, may we step towards each other, even, Lord, if there's disagreement or difficulty. May we learn what it means to step towards the other in grace and in love. In Jesus' name. Let's worship the Lord. Good news. Well, let's see.
Why don't you just bring to mind in your heart now something that you're so thankful for, to God for, for His faithfulness in your life. Just do that now. Just as we bring our time to a close, thank Him. We started with thankfulness with Ash. And thank Him now for His faithfulness in your life. And now something in the life of the church that you're so thankful for, for His faithfulness. Just thank Him now. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we bless you, Lord. We're so thankful for who you are. Thank you for your faithfulness and we choose today to follow you. Let me finish with the words from Paul. Let me speak them over you, my brothers and sisters today. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful. Everyone say faithful. Faithful. And he will do it. God's people said, amen, amen. Be blessed. Have a wonderful week. If I can pray for you in any way, I'm here down the front. Thank you.